Here we go. So good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm Bert Jackson. I'm the CEO of the Cape Cod Technology Council. I want to welcome you to our first Friday. Um, somebody's emailing me. I bet they can't get in. Nope. Just hang on. Come on in, Fred. Come on in. There we go. It's a strange new world we live in here. Um, so welcome, everybody, to our, our first Fridays. Um, uh, on every Friday, uh, except for holidays, we have an event with the Cape Cod Technology Council. Uh, the first Friday of every month, we have our signature speaker series. And on the off Fridays, we have uh, our, our coffee Q&As, which is a more casual chat with people from our, uh, from our uh, community. And just to give you a sense of what's coming up um, next week on uh, Friday the 13th, uh, we have Dr. Jane Ward, um, and she's going to be speaking about technology and public health for our coffee Q&A. I think, Jane, I see you here on the, on the uh, session here today. On November 20th, uh, we have Anna Nukas and Rennie Friedman from Soul Systems. They're a, um, a, solar, uh, a solar installer uh, financing organization. They do some really cool things, very different approach to, uh, to solar, and they are... A national company, so I'll be really curious to see their approach to different things. And then on on December fourth, our first Friday, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Tom Davenport, uh, and he's going to be talking about about artificial intelligence and the future of work. Uh, really cool guy. Uh, Ed and I had a chance to have a chat with him earlier, and I think it's going to be a wonderful um, insight into how artificial intelligence is impacting our lives and uh, what the future of that looks like. So great stuff. You can register for all those things on our website at cctechcouncil.org. So uh, with that, I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody for being here. And uh, thank you to our, our speakers today. I'm going to turn it over now to our board president, uh, Jennifer Reed, uh, from, uh, who's also from, uh, runs the Cape Cod campus at Bridgewater State University, uh, along with some other amazing uh, roles there. Uh, and Jennifer is going to be our, our host and moderator for today's talk. So Jennifer. Thank you, Bert. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see all of you this morning. We are really excited um, to have uh, President John Cox with us today and Dean Don Crampton from Cape Cod Community College. They're here today to provide us with an update, and a bit of a history, um, and progress report in the new Frank and Maureen Wilkins Science and Engineering Center. Um, so we're really excited to hear about that. I think there's a lot of synergies to be um, talked about between our organization and the great work that you do over there at the community college. As um, most of the people probably realize, I worked over at Four Cs for four years and I was lucky enough to be um, there when John Cox came in in 2012 as the president of the institution. Um, and so I'm so glad to be able to have you here in this venue. And so with that, I will turn it over to the both of you to. Uh... Okay, Jennifer, thank you. And Bert, thank you. And I, I want to thank the council for having Don and I here this morning to really share where Cape Cod is with what will become the largest investment in public higher education in a generation. And I'm, I'm really, uh, oh, there's, I am, there we go. I just had my, all right. PowerPoint popped up and sort of took out some of my notes here. Um, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm grateful to be here with Don Crampton, our Dean of STEM, who's been facilitating the college's work in the design with our architects and with DCAM. That's the Commonwealth's Division of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. And I also want to recognize Bridget Berger out there in the Zoom room and her leadership with our STEM network. So before we get into the details, let me just spend a, a quick moment on, on what we call Hope Achieved and what the new Frank and Maureen Wilkins Science and Engineering Center will entail. I, you know, as, as we look back, there are really many, many people that have been tied up in moving this initiative forward over the years. And the, the preliminary details date back about 14 years 
uh, were the, the basis for our authorization in the 2008 Massachusetts Higher Education Bond Bill actually occurred. And we did, we did get uh, out of the starting gate, so to speak, with a $42 million project back in 2014 that I'm sure many of you recall. And then as you're thinking about more recent history in 2015, we had those uh, intense uh, snow events. Um, and you'll remember the T had more problems than usual. And then the new governor uh, decided to do a reset on statewide capital investment. And our project ultimately ended up stopping uh, the bond bill that we were funded through sunset and we, we did have the foundation for our science and engineering center design, but there was really no path forward at that particular moment. After some resets and the opportunity for the college to be represented in the development of the strategic framework for the competitively uh, choosing of, of what, the, um, what statewide public higher education um, would fund in terms of capital projects, and being the only institution at the table with the Commonwealth's Administration and Finance Division, the Executive Office of Education and DCAM, we had a solid understanding going forward on uh, really what needed to be done to move this project back to life. So with the help of Representative Vieira and his leadership role on the House Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures and State Assets and our entire delegation, we were at the table advocating in both the House and the Senate as the 2018 bond bill moved forward. And we were included in that bond bill as well with a, a line. Fast forward a year beyond the, uh, the passage of the, uh, the bond bill with which authorizes um, the ability to uh, um, appropriate the funds. We were one of only six from the 28 capital project proposals that, that was actually funded. And with $25 million in the governor's capital investment plan dedicated to our project, our $42 million center in 2015 dollars was revisited and value engineered to a 38 million dollar project in 2019 dollars and with the state's investment and with the college's reserve that we had set aside to the tune of three million dollars the project requires 10 million dollars of local and community investment hence we have our capital campaign that's going on and we're about 75 percent of the way to achieving that goal. And, and you know, fortunately, a pandemic can't even stop us from, from moving ahead with this. So as Don gets ready to take over, you're gonna see through the, the Frank and Maureen Wilkin Science and Engineering Center, you're gonna see a teaching and learning center that's really acknowledging the aspects of modularity to adapt to changing technologies and modes of learning over time. And you'll see how we're working to be an example and a proving ground, if you will, of energy efficiency, sustainability, and adapting new technologies to ancient challenges. So, Don, oh, hot thank potato, you. over to you. Thank you, John. And uh, thank you to everyone for inviting us to talk about our new science building. A lot of work has been going on over the last two years. I think my third or fourth day on the job was a meeting about the new science building um, just a couple of years ago. So what I have is some artist renderings of what the building's gonna look like. So let's go through those as I talk. So this is the South approach. If you were coming up from campus, this would be coming through what we call the main entrance. Uh, the building is right in the middle of campus. And so then pur purposely designed that way. So we, on campus, we really were missing a, sort of a central shared space. And so this is the, one of the functions of the building. The building is a pavilion. It's got four front doors uh, so that it really can talk to all aspects of the campus uh, and provide that space that we were, that we were missing. Here's the... Um, north approach and so this would be 
looking kind of from the parking lots all the way on the backside of campus. And where there's that green space that you see, that's where the new old science building sits right now. So this really creates a, a whole new green space on campus and really a, a whole second so secondary entrance to the campus. And so um, providing a, you know, so another aspect of the campus that we don't have, we don't have right now. So what is it that we want the new building to do? Um, we really want a building that encourages persistence and completion for STEM students. And so what we're looking at here is one of the hallways and one of the, one of the aspects of the building are spaces for students to hang out and to study and to interact with faculty. And so you can see this space looks a little bit like a space you might find at a tech company or uh, a science company, right? These idea of the shared workspaces where people can study and work on problems and interact with each other, both students and faculty. Um, we're trying, we are interested in having a building that supports a culture of curiosity, learning and success in STEM. And so particularly downstairs, but all throughout the building, we have what you might call as science on display. Um, that anyone who's entering the building can see the science that's going on. And right here in the center of our picture is a maker space. Um, it seems a pretty boring maker space because <laughs> there's nothing in there in the drawing. Uh, but it's a maker space. Uh, we don't have a maker space on campus right now. And anyone who's, most people are probably familiar with the idea of a maker space these days, um, that is this collaborative hands-on space uh, for students to work on projects both independently and with uh, potentially with the courses that they're in. And so this space is designed to have 3D printers, um, computer aided design, uh, computers to um, design those things that will be print made by the 3D printers, um, think other things like vinyl cutters, even to the point perhaps um, sewing machines and sticker machines uh, so that students can create things uh, and courses can go in, in here. And this is a space that we really don't have on campus right now, a space where students can just go <clears throat> and create, create and innovate. Um, the building is meant to really to attract industry collaboration in STEM education. Um, again, here we are on uh, one of the same bottom floor with a makerspace sort of just down the hall is the engineering uh, laboratory. Um, anyone who knows where the engineering laboratory is now, it's in the gym and it's kind of hidden. And if you didn't know where it was, you wouldn't be able to find it. And so here, um, the engineering lab is really put pretty much in the most prominent, one of the most prominent positions places on campus. Um, this is coming into the building just from Grossman Commons where our um, food facilities are. And so almost every student would be able to be walking by this almost daily. And so this is uh, engineering on display. This is showing what's going on. And you can't quite see what's, um, you can't see it because it's behind the maker space. Um, but this is also going to have a prototyping space um, inside that prototyping space, we're going to have much more high-end uh, 3D printers and uh, computers for CAD so that we can continue as we do now and perhaps expand bringing businesses um, and industries to campus to work with our um, students. And particularly right now, we work with on-set computing. Um, students often are using those two computers or two robots that you see in the picture to help with projects or to emulate projects at onset computing where the robots themselves are making um, the chips, etc. As John mentioned previously, we really are looking for a building that provides flexibility for future workforce needs. Up on the first floor, we have six laboratories. Um, we have an environmental science laboratory, a chemistry laboratory, two anatomy and physiology laboratories, and two biology, molecular biology laboratories. But most, except for the chemistry laboratory, because we're really bound by 
the types of equipment that need to be on the table, most of the labs will look like this. And so the tables are movable. The labs themselves are modular in the sense that multiple disciplines can be taught in that laboratory. And so in the future, if we need uh, laboratories to function as different things to uh, cover different disciplines or newer courses, the laboratories will give us that flexibility. Um, we're also looking for a building that facilitates community partnership in STEM education. And so you're looking at the north facing part of the building and there's this very large um, community space and one of the lecture halls you can see and there's another lecture hall kind of behind us. And so this is looking down at the first floor. That's also where the physics learning lab is, the maker space and the engineering lab. And so that provides this rare, unique space that we also don't have on campus presently that we can invite people from the community in. So K through 12 um, community events that we can gather in that space and potentially students can then go into the maker space, students can go into the physics active learning space, they can go in um, or even view the, the engineering lab. And so this provides this space that we can um, use, particularly with the STEM network and Bridget Berger, uh, to bring people in and experience the science building. Um, you can see here that um, it's for presentations and such, we can really expand in that what you're looking at is the lecture hall and then the lecture hall opens up out into this space and then there's a projection or there'll be a screen above that lecture hall so that you can see what's going on in the lecture hall. And so this is this event learning community space um, that we don't presently have on campus. And we really were looking for a building that promotes sustainability and conservation as John had mentioned earlier. Um, this again is the picture of um, the, uh, the, the, the northern side of the building just down below. And you can see, I think the physics over there on the left, the maker space in the middle and the, the engineering space down on the right behind the stairwell. Um, so what are the sustainability and the conservation parts of the building? So the building uh, really uh, lends itself to having a rooftop uh, solar voltaic system because it's a, a pavilion. It's completely, you know, the roof is completely flat. And so um, the building has been designed to have essentially complete coverage of the roof with this uh, solar voltaic system. And what that contributes to is have, you know, contributes to the other parts of the building and the building itself is going to be LEED gold certification. At least we're on uh, pace uh, or we're on pace for the building to be such. Um, uh, the building also has, um, you know, it's component or the components of the building, the building materials are all mostly not only being selected for uh, ability to last a long time and its strength and its you know, beauty in a sense. Um, many, of the, many of those building materials we're choosing uh, are very low net carbon. And so uh, in the process of uh, building those. So I'm not gonna be able to remember the type of substance that's going out on the outside, but there was a choice between uh, something that produced a lot more carbon in its construction and another. And, um, you know, those are the kinds of choices that we've been making. So, uh, you know, this idea of being net carbon um, zero, not only in the energy of the building, but what are you doing? Um, what kinds of things are you using to build the building? How well, um, how, how well that fits into our idea of conservation. Um, so this building is going to be exceptionally efficient and exceptionally sustainable. The building, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, the building is set up to be 100% electrical so that in the future, if not immediately so, um, it's meant to be net zero, that we're not using any sort of um, any, the building can be powered in the future by any sort of renewable energy source. And so we're not using any real, we're not using any fossil fuels in the building um, directly.
As everyone is uh, likely aware, um, the Cape Cod has wastewater challenges. Um, just in the last few weeks, there's been a number of articles uh, about the toxic um, cyanobacteria blooms that we have in our ponds that are related to the nitrogen in the environment. Um, I think there was a, uh, there's been perhaps a uh, talk about what we need to do with our wastewater um, our, and that we can't build any more houses until we understand how to, how to treat our wastewater. And so the, build, the building we have uh, uh, something that we think really addresses this issue. And we're working incredibly hard with state and local uh, plumbing and building codes in order to you know, put it in the building. So what we are putting in the building is this uh, closed loop to a toilet. It's based on, it's a really later version, um, uh, much more um, a progressed version of the Caltech toilet that won the Toilet of the Future contest of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think in 2014. Um, and so we're working quite closely with that Caltech research lab and their uh, company that has created the commercial version of this toilet called EcoSan, which is in China. And we're putting it into the building. Um, it will be usable. It's not, I think, I think, I think the level is 15 flushes per day, um, but it's really uh, a, for display, um, advertising the new technology and potentially for research. There are opportunities for our students to interact and research with the toilet, particularly perhaps in collaboration with Caltech. Caltech is very interested in training students how to repair such a mechanism. Um, I'm not a plumber. Um, if anyone is out there understands um, plumbing and wastewater, the, the toilet itself is really a miniaturized um, waste treatment plant. And so all sort of just in a, in a single room. And so the water itself is constantly recycled. And so you just keep using the same water over and over again, the water gets uh, treated and once a year or so you take out um, the solids that have accumulated and no water is going out to the environment. And so it, it's hard to show where it would be in the building, but um, if you look here on the, the left-hand photo, you can see there's the actual toilet component, which is, I think is labeled number one, but there's the entire wastewater treatment facility. Um, and that's what we are going to put on display in the building is all the uh, ins and outs and the plumbing. Um, you can imagine signs and explanations of what's exactly going on. And over here on the right is an example of what it might look like. Um, that as you come into the building, particularly on the first floor, you'll have this toilet of the future there on your left hand side and the waste hot water treatment facility and what's going on will be uh, labeled and explained to explain to anyone who's entering the building. As John said, we're well on our way to achieving our full funding. This, um, there's uh, additional funds to be raised is only 2.7 million. We're so at the moment, we're 93% of the way towards our goal. And there are plenty of naming opportunities. Although I do notice that the toilet of the future is already reserved if everyone was going to uh, fight over that one. Um, so, you know, there are opportunities to uh, name uh, areas of the building. Uh, we have $2.7 million left. We're 93% of the, percent of the way there. Um, and so I think, you know, we're well on our way to achieving our, our achieving our dream. And we are breaking ground. We broke ground um, in fall 2020, just a few months ago. If anyone who's been on the college campus recently, those lecture halls are completely gone. That was, uh, I think for a lot of faculty, particularly because of the pandemic, you know, the, the construction kind of happened, you know, without any observant. And I think um, one of our college meetings, John showed the lecture halls 
being gone. And it was a pretty shocking moment, I think, for everyone to see that the, the build, building of the, the construction of the building is progressing. And we are at the moment on pace to open the build, brand new building in spring 2023. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Don. That this is a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to open it up now to the audience for folks that um, have questions. Um, I can start with one question or you know, kind of comment I want to ask um, President Cox. Um, President Cox, can you talk about the significance of the five million dollar donation from Maureen and Frank Wilkins? And just you know what that means for the campus here in West Barnstable, but also just the significance in higher education in general. It it, it was truly it is truly a transformational gift. Um, it it really helped propel this whole project along. That it it the capital campaign was uh, clearly achievable. Um, and it really, it, it sort of, it became the rocket fuel to, uh, to, to drive this, this effort. Um, and it, it's been the, the Wilkins and, and uh, you know, the Mr. Wilkins of late and then Mrs. Wilkins continuing on have really been um, all out for the college over the years. Tremendous, tremendous supporters of what we do, um, all starting from a... Uh, you know, an altruistic um, uh, experience with, with one of our students and just making the commitment. Um, it, it actually drew a lot of national attention because when you're a community college, you know, people, number one, don't think community colleges are in fundraising. Um, so it's sort of a, a novel thought. Um, but it, you know, it also, it goes back to the, the notion that, you know, people, you can give you can give $5 million to Harvard, you can give $5 million to your local community college. The ultimate outcome of those dollars, much more transformational when you're, when you're right there in the community, when you're, you're touching the lives of people who are being educated in the community and pretty much the, the majority of our graduates will continue to stay in our community, they'll be the workers, they'll be the families, they'll be the, the support moving forward. So it's, it's just, it's the, the giving to the community college has a multiplier effect. And this, this investment becomes the basis for so many of the people that we depend on in our community from the nurses graduating and, and working in healthcare to the, the, the folks working in the labs and in the, the manufacturers on the Cape to the, um, the, the office, the culinary, the hospitality people. So this, most of the students coming through the college at some point are going to interface with what's going on in this in this center so it's uh truly transformational the wilkins have been phenomenal at really driving cape cod community college forward in ways that you know many of our other community colleges out there haven't been able to do because of this generosity so it, it's really we're very appreciative and it, it's a it's a motivator for a lot of people. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we have a question in the chat from Robin, um, who's on our board from Cape Space. She's wondering um, about, you know, do you see that this uh, new um, science um, and engineering center will have an impact on um, enrollment and maybe programming, things like that? Don, I lost you. There you are. <laughs> you yeah. want Wanna... Yeah, I, well, I, I know that uh, we're often, um, we don't re want to rely on the new science building to uh, bump up enrollment. But I, on the other hand, I do know that um, no one has opened a new science building without a bump up in enrollment. So I do think the building itself provides a uh, focus for excitement. Um, that it'll be a world-class facility, you know, it is going to look impressive when people visit the campus. Um, it'll be on par, if not better, than the facilities that the students are coming from on the Cape, which is not uh, the reality now. You know, I think some students 
particularly STEM students who will come to our campus. Um, they're going to get amazing instruction and incredibly dedicated professors, but at the moment they're going to get a lab from the 1960s. So, you know, I think that will be an important part uh, of attracting students to campus. Um, will it allow us to create new programs? Um, well, I definitely think that, you know, one wants their uh, science and STEM programs to evolve as the community evolves. Um, and I think I talked with Bert about um, a new program we were trying to build called the Blue Economy. Um, and, you know, I think the building only gives us more flexibility um, to create those programs that, you know, that the Cape and the local area need based on our workforce needs. Yeah, several folks, um, you know, here in this meeting today are um, heavily involved in the efforts regarding the blue economy here on the Cape. Um, you know, Steve Tom asked in the chat, oops, it's going away, is there a plan to intentionally connect the science curriculum to the Cape Cod economy and blue economy businesses and related jobs? I suspect likely that is already happening, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, sure. I think, you know, we do have, um, you know, we have transfer science programs, you know, biology, physics, chemistry, et cetera. Um, we also support our internal, you know, health sciences. So, you know, nursing is an incredibly popular, important major on our campus. All those nurses take our science courses. Um, and we have those programs, which are more workforce uh, related, environmental science, um, engineering. And so we already work with lots of um, businesses on the Cape. And I will say that uh, at the moment, we are working very hard to get a blue economy degree, in which we will work directly with those blue economy uh, programs, which um, would be you know, a program that is essentially kind of brand new in the building building as well opens at the same time. And so, yes, yeah, so as I said, intentionally connect the science curriculum. Um, we, at a community college, we, can't, we do this all the time, particularly those uh, programs which are more workforce related. Um, those programs have advisory boards. And so local businesses sit on those advisory boards um, and they help us uh, build the curriculum and tell us what should be in our courses so that our students are prepared to go into their um, to be their future employees. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so we have another question uh, here in the chat um, from another question from Robin that I think is pretty uh, timely. She said, can you share your thoughts on the growing, on the STEM movement versus the growing science denier sentiment in the country? <laughs> share my thoughts? Yeah, sure. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> I think it. I think it's incredibly. I think it's incredibly odd um, to be uh, anti-intellectual, anti-science. Um, you know, science. I think, if anything, science literacy becomes more and more important every every day. Um, our lives are changed by robots, artificial intelligence, um, and just the skills that science teaches you. Science teaches you essentially to say why, right? Um, you know, Carl Sagan said, science is more than a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking. And he th said that if you don't know science, how do you know when someone's lying to you? Um, because how can you investigate that? So I think that's incredibly important in this, um, particularly this political climate, you know, the idea of research and looking at data and what does the data and analyzing that data and uh, and you know either proving or disproving your hypothesis, you know that essentially has to be um, a way of life because of the way we have to, you know, comb through all types of information that we're being flooded with from the internet. You know, to know to be to think scientifically, I think is incredibly helpful in that in that sense. So. Obviously, I'm a big fan, big fan of science. So I think, you know, science, one of the important parts about this science building is that all students will go through it, right? At the community college, um, all students to get a degree are required to take two science classes and a math class. And so 
math classes, the two science classes, they have to take one class with a lab and one class, or they have to take at least one class with a lab. And so all of the, you know, 3,000 and some students that we have will take um, science courses in this new building. And science on display, um, a brand new building, uh, rooms uh, that are meant, you know, right now our science building kind of fights against us in a sense, if we want to do the education that we want to do, hands-on active learning in the classroom. Um, and this building is meant to facilitate that instead of sort of fight against us. And so I think not only will science look better, I think science will be, uh, be able to be taught better. And so I think our students will be, be much more interested in what's going on in the classroom. Thank you. Another question um, and comment from the chat from Jane B. Ward. Uh, congratulations on this remarkable new STEM center. I applaud your high sustainability rating and community interaction. She is particularly interested in the um, healthy buildings in addition to green buildings. Is it, uh, it is wonderful to know about, uh, she'd like to know about the functioning windows and about the toilet of the future. Can you comment on the aspect of indoor air quality and on-site management, more of the plumbing output? I, I received the president, I could throw that one to the president. The, the, uh, the air quality? <laughs> You know, I, I'm an accountant by training, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, we, uh, the, the windows in the, uh, the, the office area, primarily external, they, they are operable, they can be opened. And, and part of that was to, you know, enable people to uh, have the fresh ventilation. There is, we've done the math on the, um, the turnover of the air based on the, um, the ceiling configuration that we have where we don't have the, the suspended uh, tile ceiling, it's, it's sort of an open top. And the, uh, I know some of the concern of late has been the, um, the refresh rate given COVID-19 and we're within the, the realm of what the CDC guidance has been in that refresh. And if people have specific questions about that, I can get you the, the official technical jargon to explain it, but we're, we seem to be uh, pretty, pretty well on that front. On the, the Toilet of the Future initiative, um, in, um, in 2014, I, I had two opportunities. One, I did a, a short-term Fulbright to India, and then six months later, I got called by the State Department under the Obama administration um, to work on the, the um, U.S.-India higher education dialogue when at the time that India was looking at building out a lot of community colleges. Um, in the process of being there, um, we, it was really clear that one of the fundamental issues across the country is uh, wastewater and in particular how it affects um, uh, women and children in school that when you don't have facilities, um, people tend to drop out of education. Um, I had some interface with the folks from the Gates Foundation, actually uh, spoke at length with them, um, learned quite a bit about the Reinvent the Toilet Initiative. Um, actually on one of my summer vacations, I, I stopped in to see and meet the, uh, the folks who won the, uh, the reinvent the toilet initiative at Caltech and you know sort of touchy and feely the what the facilities is and basically they were building out um, shipping containers that could go around the world and be you know these little wastewater treatment plants that are available available to people but all along the 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 push by the Gates Foundation is okay we have the technology it's out there it's growing but the, the unit costs are still way, way too high. And we, we really need to take the technology and push it out to commercial realm where it's, it's much more in use, it's much more accepted and the costs are pushed down further. And the costs have declined with what we see um, with uh, where we are with EcoSan. Uh, but our hope, we would become the first location in North America to actually have this facility in a um, in a, a public operation. And the hope is that we're 
we're moving the technology forward as, as another option rather than um, you know, having an outhouse, having an incinerator toilet, or having to build out multi-billion dollar infrastructures to you know, flow wastewater to a treatment plant. Maybe there's another option here that we can work with and promote and we'll be in on the front end of it. And, you know, Cape Cod becomes a lab. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of dialogue over the years, but uh, the one thing that we have learned at Cape Cod Community College, whether we're doing aviation programs, whether we're doing science buildings or toilets of the future, that sometimes you have to be patient and you just need to stick with it and then you can achieve the goal. That's where we are. Thank you, John. Um, Interesting question here about um, the, the curriculum direction uh, and matricula matriculation options. So uh, Jeff wrote, it, there's a very positive tension between the STEM branded development effort. Um, and how would you relate that from the perspective of a more traditional uh, community college path uh, versus pure workforce development pathway? Excellent question. Do we have how many hours do we have? Um, so the college, it's uh, the, the STEM programs um, have many individual um, articulation agreements. So for example, our engineering program has articulation agreements with the engineering programs at UMass Dartmouth and UMass Lowell, um, because sometimes it's just easier that way and that there's a lot of specific requirements for four-year schools, particularly in the technical or um, engineering fields. Um, of course, there is the mass transfer pathway itself, um, which really sort of tells exactly what students need to take so that they can transfer to four-year schools. Um, that is all, that's all online. You type in degree, the degree that you want um, and what where community college you're at and what school you wanna to go to and it will tell you exactly what courses you need to take. And so I, that's obviously extremely popular. Um, and I, I agree that on a, college, on a community college campus, you have sometimes those two populations, those that are transferring on and want to get a bachelor's degree and those that are perhaps more workforce um, related. Um, one thing I can say is I think the college itself and in STEM particularly, um, we're working on trying to make those associate's degrees a lot more viable. You know, by definition, an associate's degree seems to be halfway. So what is if, you know, what if you don't want to go on and get a bachelor's degree? You know, what does it mean to be halfway? Well, perhaps you can make that um, associate's degree a lot more um, valuable. So we are thinking about professional skills, digital badges, um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, getting out, working with the community, having internships, that sort of thing, getting real life experience so that our students are ready to go into jobs directly after graduating from mm -hmm. Cape Cod and having a secondary sort of off ramp instead of everyone needing to go on and get a bachelor's degree. Thank you. Um, Bert, I, I, I can no longer see the chat because I had to drop off for a second, but so can you help me? Sure. Uh, well, I just had a question. Um, can you tell us about the architectural firm that's working on the building? Um, they are, their name is Pay Payette. I believe they must be out of Boston. Um, they've been, in, in, I've been blown away. After, after I had a few conversations with them, I thought to myself, man, I should have been an architect. Um, they are uh, oh, nice. problem, they are problem solvers. Um, you know, I don't know how many times along the way you know, they've asked us exactly, you know, we say we need this done, you know, and they come back and they've got this new sort of solution. Um, they, if you were to visit their offices, they are just have hundreds of projects of similar types, you know, all over. So they are pretty well known, I would guess, in the field of academic buildings, particularly science buildings. Let me just add to that. We were also able to carry them over from the first project so that we, we didn't lose a lot of effort when we started this back in 2014. That's, that's great. 
Um, so Eldon had a question about how can we, what, what can be hap what can happen at the, at the secondary school level to help prepare students to be more ready to, to come into the community college and take advantage of uh, the new facilities that are there? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the our um, more evolving position is what can we do to be more prepared for those students? And so, you know, there's this idea of an institution being student ready. Um, and, you know, the students who come out of out of secondary school, and that's how they come out of secondary school. You know, Cape Cod Community College is an open access institution. Um, so what can we do um, to remove as many barriers as possible at the community college level for those students to be um, successful? And that's, you know, we're in the midst of revising our math curriculum. We're in the midst of uh, doing a lot more active learning on campus. Um, we're really trying to become much more student ready, you know, be prepared to teach the students that come to you. That's great. If someone's interested in teaching at, uh, at four C's, who do they contact? That's another really great question. Um, you know, when we have positions, which we often do, those are always posted. Um, but I would not discourage emailing the Dean directly and saying, you know, this is what, this is, this is my skill set. These are the types of things I'm interested in teaching. Um, so that, you know, you would be, uh, you, you, you could be told ahead of time that a position is going to be posted. Uh, or if, you know, we might, we might say, oh my God, we have exactly that need. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to be posting this position. You should, you should, uh, um, you know, be aware. I would add to that as someone with uh, 16 years experience in higher education, don't call. <laughs> it's better to professionally introduce yourself via email, provide your resume, you know, give a introduction to yourself, explain, you know, what your, you know, experiences are, and, you know, that your connection to the Cape, I think also helps. But um, I know, you know, having, being a sort of on the front lines, a lot of people call and it's really best to, you know, do the work, find out who the Dean is or the department chair, email them both. Um, I know that that is generally well received from folks in, in, in higher ed. Um, are there other questions? Bridget, do you have any comments or observations about how this will transform your work? I am so glad you asked me that. Thank you, because this is so exciting. You know, the role that I play at the, at the community college is really as a connector to the community, as a connector to industry. So as John explained and showed, I think you'll see with this building, how transparent it is to see what's happening um, when you come to the building for any reason, you'll be engaged um, just visually, you can see what's happening. But um, I'm really excited to help to bring industry together to partner with our faculty to create those kind of hands on opportunities like we're doing with Onset and Rick Bashar as engineering students. Um, I think there's so many opportunities to do more of that. Also, the other piece that I just wanna mention is one of the things we do a lot with the STEM network is K through 12 teacher professional development. So Eldon, to get to your question, one of the ways that I think we are have making a difference in the Cape and Islands community is through these institutes that we hold for teachers. So with this new building, there's real opportunity to bring teachers in, train them in a variety of methods, whether it's the um, the teaching methods or whether it's the equipment or whether it's forming collaborations and just making the K through 12 um, community stronger, I think is something that we can do with this space that we haven't had before. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, Angela, thank you for your great words. We're very proud to have one of your adjunct faculty members on our board, new board member, Angela from Cape Forward. Um, Henry has a question. Has there been much thought about developing a program aimed at bridge construction? There may be a job market in that field rather soon. <laughs> uh, one, can only, one can only hope that, um, I, also I think one of the first things I did, we, John and I went to a meeting about uh, constructing the new, uh, the new bridges. Uh, that's an interesting question. 
Um, you know, I think one of the things that we are learning and focusing on is how can m many institutions work together to provide uh, specific skills. And so this is not particularly about the bridge, but at bridge building, but at the moment we work deep, pretty closely with Bristol and you, uh, Bristol and Bridgewater and um, ourselves to interact with the, um, uh, what's going on with offshore wind. Um, and I was, I would assume there are many um, skills that are associated with offshore wind um, that are associated with bridge building as well. And so I think, you know, have building these uh, programs that are sort of these high tech um, and technological skills, I think are cut across different areas. So right off the top of my head, I know for the offshore wind that the uh, Maritime Academy has courses in working at heights. Uh, I'm assuming that's a very similar thing you might have to do when you're building a bridge is learn how to work at heights. And so I think that's the kind of thing that would cross over. Well, thank you so much for, um, for all of this, for the great conversation, for the Q&A and for the presentation and sharing all those renderings with us as someone who has um, you know, worked at the institution and cares very deeply about um, the students and faculty and staff at that institution. I think it's going to be so transformative and um, it's going to be such a great opportunity for everyone in our region to have this as a resource in so many different avenues, not just in the classroom. Um, and we look forward to hopeful continued partnership from the Tech Council and the Community College. I mean, as you can see, actually we have um, Bridget on our board as well. And so there's lots of engagement. And of course, we're always open to hearing from you you, uh, Don, and you, President Cox, if there's any ideas you have about synergies between our two organizations. Um, Bert, is there anything else I'm missing or I haven't done that I should be doing besides thanking our great speakers? Uh, Jennifer, you, you just said it. Uh, Don, John, thank you so much for this. I'm so excited about this building on, on so many levels. I love the sustainability aspect of it. I think it's going to be a real uh, centerpiece for our region in terms of being an example for what uh, sustainable building looks like. Uh, I'm really excited about the opportunities uh, for um, students coming through this, this facility uh, over the next, uh, the next many years. So thank you so much for all of your hard work on this and, and putting it together. Thanks, thanks Bert. Thanks, Jennifer. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Hi, thank, thank you. Thanks right. for having us. We're, we're very excited about the new building as well. Yes, I bet you are. Um, so I think that wraps us up for today. Jennifer, thanks so much for, for an amazing uh, moderator. Um, thanks to our speakers. Thanks to everybody who is here today. Uh, thanks for all your great comments in the chat. Um, I'll leave this up for a minute. If there's something that you want to download from the chat, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And hopefully we'll have this up on our YouTube channel uh, in, in not too long of a time. So thanks very much, everybody. Maybe we'll see you next week for, uh, for Dr. Jane Ward. Take care. Bye-bye. You're still recording.